Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second of our four-part online fitness and wellness summit. My name is Ross Campbell. I am the founder of Fit Summit. It's a pleasure to welcome you all online. Thank you for taking this leap of faith and becoming virtual crusaders as we connect and inform each other through COVID-19. A huge thanks also to all of our sponsors, exhibitors and speakers. Uh, our platform, our network is simply not possible without their continued support. So thank you very much indeed. These are challenging times. Uh, we ourselves have had to pivot somewhat digitally, and that will be a theme running across today's event. Our job today and over the next few weeks is to make sure our platform provides you with information, insight, and that human touch, of course, that we're all looking forward to having once the restrictions are fully lifted. On the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see the icons for stage. We are here now. This is the main stage broadcasting. Below that, sessions. Uh, the sessions will start at uh, about one hour and 15 minutes, and you'll have a number of sessions in parallel to choose from. Networking is also there, face-to-face -face webcam, three-minute uh, round-robin randomized networking. If you want to connect with somebody, simply press the connect button in front of you and you'll share your information directly afterwards. If for some reason you connect with a colleague, simply press the leave button in the screen and you can get busy with networking with somebody else. The exhibition is also on for every second of this event. We've got some fantastic sponsors, videos, you can live chat to them directly. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see the chat box here of the event chat. Uh, our team uh, will, not, will give some big points, big announcements to make sure that you understand what's happening and the sessions that are running and to make sure we navigate you as best as possible. You'll also see the polls. There are about six or seven polls in there. They take about 20, 25 seconds uh, to complete. Please complete them. We will share the results with you afterwards. On Friday, we'll email you a link to our website. In that web page will be all the session recordings, as well as some important documents and the survey results. What I want to leave you with is simply have fun. Uh, I know these are challenging times. We have to stay optimistic. We have to make sure that we are inspiring people and making sure that we are still connecting for growth in the long run. Have fun with this platform, have fun with this event, and make sure that you reach out to as many people as possible. Let's kick off, ladies and gentlemen. First up, we have a special keynote session with three fantastic speakers who are going to address the future of digital and wellness online. First of all, Paul Bowman is CEO of Wexer, one of the leading virtual companies at the moment, providing solutions to companies across health and fitness and wellness. And Paul can introduce himself in just a few minutes time. We have Sam Canavan, who is the general manager for Asia Pacific and Middle East at ClassPass, of course, the multi-billion dollar US company, fitness class health aggregator. And Sam can say more about that in a second. And last but not least, Francesco Alotti, head of digital solutions at Technogym. Of course, one of the world's leading equipment manufacturers and technology companies, not just to fitness and wellness, but also to government, medical, and the wider health communities. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Let me just allow you to say a couple of minutes each about who you are, what your company does, and of course, maybe a little bit about your last couple of months. Paul, if you'd like to start, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Well, firstly, thank you for having me on. Appreciate being here. Um, so my mission and, and Wix's mission is is very aligned. It's into essentially making world class um, exercise accessible to people through technology. But the the core of Wixer is making sure that the, the 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 clubs and the operations and the wellness facilities that we support is is at the heart of that experience the whole time. Um, Wix uh, is a is a B two B to C company, um, and we deliver group exercise content and programming to our client clients and members anytime, anywhere, on any device. Um, uh, essentially, we the, the, we we wanted to hit maybe before COVID, and, and of course that's accelerating right now. Is essentially having maximum convenience, maximum variety to to for members to choose 
high quality workouts whenever we're about. Um, our platforms enable health clubs uh, and, and operators uh, essentially become a hub of connected fitness experiences and remain relevant to their membership base 24-7, 365. Um, all, of, all of our platforms are, are, are white labelled um, and we serve the majority of the top 25 clubs in the world and some of the biggest hotel groups in the world now as well. Um, and then just a kind of a few a few stats. In, in 2019, um, we delivered over 10 million fitness experiences across 50 countries. Um, now we're actually forecasting that to be over 25 million. We, we've seen over 700% increase of users on our, on our platforms through um, our operators that we work with. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess it's very, very unprecedented, which uh, in terms of the rise of our home fitness and uh, yeah, quality experiences in terms of um, uh, fitness at home. So that's a little, little intro. Thanks for that, Paul. Uh, Francesco, if you could take over the baton, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, my name is Francesco Arlotti. I'm uh, the head of digital uh, solution sales and technology, and uh, I'm taking care of uh, uh, the digital platform, so uh, my wellness cloud and all the uh, connectivity with the equipment. Uh, but just a quick introduction about uh, technology. Uh, uh, a company that for over 30 years has committed to, pro to promote wellness, uh, uh, wellness as a lifestyle based on uh, regular physical exercise, balanced diet and the, posi and the positive mental attitude. We rely on uh, over 2,200 employees, 14 branches, and currently we export 90% of the production to over 100 uh, uh, countries. Now, uh, as far as I'm, I'm in charge for uh, digital, uh, let me, uh, uh, let's say, explain a little bit about uh, our uh, heritage, uh, because actually Technogen Digital Heritage started in 1996 when we released our first uh, software platform, Wellness System, that was the, the first uh, ever software prescription, uh, software that was featuring equipment control and automation. In a moment, allow me to say, where no one was uh, actually asking for that. It's very different from, from the situation we are, we are today. And then uh, this platform evolved in 2012 into My Wellness Cloud, uh, which, is, uh, which is what we are offering to the market today. Thanks to My Wellness Cloud, uh, operators can offer to customers uh, a personalized training experience that is accessible wherever they are, in the gym, in a room, at home, wherever. And uh, actually today, over 15 million end users and 15,000 wellness centers around the world uh, are using uh, uh, My Wellness Cloud. Uh, I would like to complete by saying uh, how we, what we have done uh, uh, over the last six weeks. We have been supporting uh, over 2,500 facilities to implement uh, uh, a train at home program during the lockdown through My Wellness Cloud. And this gives you an idea of the huge acceleration that has been a triple digit uh, acceleration of, uh, of uh, our consultancy. Um, and this is a proof also of the digital acceleration that we have obs observed during the last weeks. Now we are very busy to support operators in the reopening phase and in evolving the business model, model as the new normal will require. But that's why we are really looking forward to joining the Fit Summit today and collect also, you know, feedback uh, and additional inspiration uh, as we have to do it all together as an industry. Thank you, Francesco. And Sam? Thanks, Ross, and thanks for having me. So my name is Sam Tanneman. I'm the general manager of ClassFast in Asia Pacific and the Middle East. Ross, thank you for calling us a multi-billion dollar company. That's wonderful of you. In actuality, we scraped over the one billion dollar valuation. <laughs> In uh, depends what currency, maybe in bars, I suppose we're very much multi-billion. But uh, yes, first first unicorn of uh, the decade, which is very exciting. ClassFast is the world's biggest uh, fitness and wellness subscription. So if you haven't heard of ClassFast, it's essentially an app and a website, and you jump on and through signing up, it's a subscription model on month-to-month -month rolling basis, and you can access more than thirty thousand fitness and wellness venues all across the world. So we're in thirty countries at the moment. We actually expanded from four into 30 countries over about the last 18 months, which has just been an incredible tear for us. And the last the last couple of months, of course, have been very harrowing for, for our business as it's been for the whole industry 
we we've seen revenues fall off a cliff. We we've been forced to cut costs wherever possible. But ultimately, the north star of Class Pass is to deliver our partners purely incremental revenue that they wouldn't have received otherwise. Every business has a demand curve. There's always going to be your direct members. There's always going to be your drop-ins. But fitness should not be any different from the wholesale industry or the airline industry or any other industry that uses aggregators to fill that bottom 20 to 30% of their demand curve. So that's what we've been doubling down on. We've uh, committed to raising as much money as we can to help our studio partners through donations up to a uh, million US dollars. We're matching. We've been trying to lobby governments all over the world to uh, prioritize and help the health and wellness industry. And we've also launched a live stream uh, about eight weeks ago to help studios monetize the, the live classes that they're hosting. So we've got a couple of thousand of partners. Uh, many of them are on this call, uh, Jack from Base, for example, or the Barry's guys. I'm not sure if Pete from Yoga Movement might finally get on board. That'd be wonderful. Uh, the Ritual guys, for example, to name a few. So live stream is uh, is going really well for ClassPass. Ultimately, though, a tough time where we're excited for offline to resume as well. But we've uh, we've been trying to help our partners as much as possible during this time. And uh, yeah, it's just, you know, there are decades where nothing happens and, and there are weeks where decades happen. And uh, <laughs> this is 2020. So thanks for having us again, Russ. Thanks, Sam. Okay, gents, let's get stuck in, as they say. Uh, the first topic we want to address, ladies and gentlemen, is the current status quo. Now, as Francesco alluded to earlier, we have had this huge acceleration into digital online fitness and wellness. It's been almost consumer-led, but of course, businesses have to match that consumer uh, behavior and follow as best we can. So, Looking at the here and the now, some of the behaviors, some of the trends, uh, some of the kind of the challenges you've overcome to get to this point. Paul, let me just jump you in here straight away. What is the status quo at the moment that you think within digital fitness and wellness? Yeah, I, I, the phrase new normal is, is, is probably the easiest way to do it. I think, I think fundamentally we have to be looking at the status quo is now a hybrid model. Um, and a hybrid model being essentially being supporting people at home, having a digital journey at home that's well thought through, that, that can be monetized, and a digital journey, of course, when we when we reopen. But I think, you know, I know we'll go into kind of advice, but there needs to be a thought pattern now uh, from my point of view is that home fitness journey and that physical journey needs to have the same amount of attention. And, and actually right now, I would actually say that digital home fitness journey needs to have some have far more thought patterns, you know, like in regards to what what am I offering? How is it special? How am I unique? You know, the same same things that we do all the time as operators, but we need to do that in our home channels. And and have we got the right technologies to support us? Because we have to offer, offer value to those those memberships and you know a, a value at home through the memberships that they already have. And I think you know what we're seeing from a statistical point of view. Is that we've got you know operators that have taken this as a huge opportunity i think especially the ones that have already invested heavily in platforms you know we've seen an over 400 percent increase with some of our operators in regards to their overall database you know looking at it at, at, at a way of um essentially when they open the doors up again they can either convert digital members and or physical members because the base is so much higher and i think the other thing that i'd like to bring out is you know we're we're actually looking at particular clubs and seeing what their average swipes were per day and looking at our platform in terms of how much they're engaging. And there's about a, they have a 96% correlation um, in regards to how much swipes were being on a Monday and how much people were using a, the system on a Monday. So there's there's some uniqueness in this, you know, and, and but again, we'll go into strategies and, and, and how what I guess operators are doing really well, but that's my status quo right now. Sure. Uh, Francesco, if you wouldn't mind just jumping in here now, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, for me, the key, uh, one of the key word uh, also using some words that uh, uh, we we found out uh, during a, a late uh, a recent webinars that we have, we have done is digital. Uh, what does it mean? I want to use the, a, an example coming for a moment, an example coming from a different industry. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with the fact that uh, restaurants were closed, uh, were forced to close. And that was a very tough situation like we are experiencing in our in our industry but uh, we have observed that to a number of uh, pioneeristic approach uh, i have a great kitchen i have great people this food uh, from my kitchen can reach uh, people wherever they are for example at home 
And we have seen even in the food uh, industry, and I'm, ta I'm not talking about large things, I'm talking about the restaurant that is uh, very close to my neighborhood, who started pioneering digital and uh, make available the menu directly on an application so that people could uh, go on enjoying the food uh, at home. In doing this, uh, probably restaurants have learned something. There is no doubt that everyone is looking forward to reopen, no doubt about it. But at the same time, the need that I have when I go to the restaurant is a need to go to a place but then there are people that uh, when order food at home, they have a different need, which is, I don't want to go to the restaurant. I want to have the food reaching my home. So the bottom line of this is that uh, uh, restaurants for sure have learned something in this period that will allow them to increase their market space. Now, we are not in the business of restaurant. We are in the business of uh, uh, fitness, wellness, and health. Uh, over the last uh, six weeks, we have conducted 160 webinars uh, uh, with 5,000 participants and 2,500 facilities that wanted to learn how to train customers at home with our digital uh, uh, platform. And um, this combined a number of things, training content, workout of the day, streaming content, outdoor training, remote coaching. Uh, but we have also observed an incredible amount of social media usage which is great because this is a way to promote the service at home. But I would like to uh, uh, point the attention on one potential risk of this, because uh, an overexposure of all this content could lead to a commoditization, especially if it is uh, just something that you go on Google, you put some keyword, and here you go, you find all the best content. Now I think the challenge would be keep what we, have, what we learned so far and reconduct all of this uh, into a proposition within a regular relationship between the operator and the customers, preventing as much as we can commoditization, commoditization because this will lead uh, negat uh, to negative impact. Thanks, Francesco. Really good points raised, and we'll come back a little bit to do more about um, exact platforms and strategies for executing digital. Sam, at the moment, let's um, keep on the status quo and get a bit from your own perspective. You're dealing with a lot of studios and, of course, with the consumer itself. What are you seeing in terms of trends, behavior, and on the ground? Sure. So uh, a key point I want to land is that a good offline experience and a good offline operator and a good offline brand and a good offline instructor and a good offline previous model does not make it a good online product. So this is something key we see. Our, our single biggest uh, receiver of reservations across the world at Class Bars is uh, essentially a, a mum and pop yoga studio at the back of London called East of Eden. Great experience online, very low cost fit out, but what they've done is taken the experience from the studio to online. Number one, they move quickly and early. So we saw that first mover advantage. But number two, they they really fundamentally thought about the entire user journey and the UX and the UI and what that was going to look like end to end. So that's something that I, I want to highlight. It's just because you're a, you're a big brand name that's established and has you know a beautiful fit out and Dyson hair dryers and ASOP products. That that means nothing in in a world where you're against digital natives like a, a Sweat or a Peloton who are big VC or PE funded, who have marketeers who are dedicated towards data-centric marketing. It's, it's two, so two things. Number one, good offline does not make good online. Number two, from a demand perspective, good offline marketing is so different to online, right? These guys are so sophisticated. So if you're not dealing with business intelligence tools, if your marketeers are not digital natives, if you're not thinking about a funnel and a messaging comms flow and retargeting and different platforms and a dedicated offer, uh, it's, it's certainly, you're not going to cut it. So what, what we're seeing in class class is the brands who invest more in a dedicated strategy towards digital are performing best, as opposed to an offline brand who says, hey, I'm insert brand name, and I'm just going to essentially blast my database with an email saying, hey, we've got digital now, and expect them to flock and follow. In such a saturated marketplace, that is not good enough. Thanks, Sam. Sticking on this, I mean, Paul, I think we talked uh, on a previous call about yourself and Francesco and other technology providers have been obviously pushing the benefits of becoming digital to operators for a longer time, of course, than this, this crisis alone. 
Have the benefits resonated within these operators? Do they understand the benefits? Are they moving quickly enough? And do you think that for some, there is the chance that post this COVID crisis, they will return to old habits, um, return to the old norm, if it will, or is this the new norm forever and everyone is going to be there? Thoughts on that, Paul? And I'll come to yourself, Francesco, in a second. Yeah, I think answering that question is so. So I think operators that had already had a large amount of investment before going into COVID, of course, have seen a significant um, benefit in doing so um, because they've been able to reach customers and deliver value, um, you know, expertise, programming, and 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 the rest all the time. But the and I think there's a there is a viewpoint that there is definitely the operators that are I wouldn't say buried ahead in the sand, but they think it's just going to come straight back. And I, and I think, you know, I, I, you know, my personal belief and, you know, we're, we're doing the studies right now in terms of working some operators to understand what does consumer behavior mean when we open up again. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that people are trusting the brands. People are trust, they, they actually trust the operator. They trust the operator will be clean. They trust all the procedures that they'll put in place, but they don't trust the other members. Um, and so a lot of our a lot of our research is saying, okay, you know, we want to reward program. So if you are able to like offer live anymore, you know, and, and that's a good question, are you able to cost effectively offer live? But the feedback that we're getting is that that actually needs to essentially be a VIP experience. You know, we want it to be, we've seen, you know, uh, Ross's uh, class at five o'clock on, on a live stream class on five o'clock on a on a Friday twice. That means I get access to a VIP treatment because you know I can't now my group exercise room used to be able to fit 50 now it can only fit nine, um, and they want that catered to them and I think that that's where uh, I am worried about where the operators think that they can just go back to normal and I think fundamentally digital is going to that's going to have to be forced back onto them because I think they'll open they'll make the mistake that it's going to be exactly the same um, and then they have to go back into okay thinking about that home journey you know and and I you know realistically I think all of us are saying really we just want to have our expertise of an operator you know delivered both offline and online and, and as sam said it's so right you know you, we've we've kind of seen the rise of three levels of content you know before COVID, from a wexa point of view it was all about you know high quality live streaming and pre-recorded content that that was the the blend in our world but we really have seen the power of localized content like you know that that person that you're so used to delivering had, had been delivering a session is now delivering um you know via virtual stream it doesn't actually have to be the best but if the personality is still coming out that they, they will still cater to the people that they're used to you know to sam's point they might not be able to grow that base but those three combinations are a key for me in terms of how an operator opens up again is having a live stream or putting the investment into live stream, um, it's still having their local stars, you know, and, and try and make a world where they can be kind of, um, if they are doing a live session, they are doing it based off like a VIP um, feeling, you know, in terms of how you access that person, because it's more exclusive now. And then of course you're on demand, pre-recorded content is, is crucial as well. So yeah, that's, that, that's my viewpoints. Sure. Francesco, let, let's talk about this briefly and then we'll dovetail into some of the challenges that operators are facing when they are selecting, adopting and then implementing digital. So your thoughts, if you will, please, on the current operator mindset and the challenges they are facing and how they can overcome those across this digital journey. Sure. Um... Let me say, first of all, uh, your clients are the most important uh, uh, focus for you uh, as a business. So uh, I think uh, we will need to be very flexible in identifying uh, what is the journey that we have to build around them. So don't force your aspiration into them, but try to understand uh, what their new needs are. So I'll give you an example. Some of them will be happy to be back. At some point, we will reopen the business. It's happening with different timing, but it will happen. Some of them will be happy to be back, but of course, we have to reassure them. So these are some challenges that we can transform into opportunities. First, defining safety and sanitization protocols according to local, uh, to local rules. Designing a, a new gym experience that will secure social distancing, but again, Digital technologies can help uh, a lot to manage also the reopening because it's very likely that you will not have to manage just the booking of a class, but probably you will need to, to manage reservation 
of every single service that you are offering because there's, there's going to be some limitations and some restrictions. On the other side, some other people might be might feel more comfortable at home or in other spaces. I'm not just talking about home, but for example, what about an hotel? What about the hotel room? So we need to be creative in finding the new spaces. And uh, we, will need, we will need to be good at creating an offer also for those uh, who are not uh, uh, ready to access or are, are not ready to access uh, uh, beyond a certain number of days. Um, which leads uh, to the final uh, point that, I, that, you, that you have asked. What is, uh, generally speaking, the challenge of implementing a digital project? Because uh, uh, I want to be very honest with you. I mean, I can present you incredible success case. I can present you also incredible failure. So the product is the same. Why in some case create a great success and in another one create a failure? Because uh, there is uh, one main element of our industry. We started physical. So we, we, we think physical and we struggle to think digital. And we tend to think that digital is a logo or is a set of features or it is something like a treadmill that I can put on a gym floor and it's going to work. This is wrong. Actually, digital is a journey. So when, when we talk about a, a, a facility, we go through body analysis, assessment, prescription, follow up. When, with people at home, it will not be different. There's going to be assessment that can be done maybe in, in a gym. Then the program I can also enjoy at home or in a room. Uh, and then I, I will need, in any case, to review uh, to review my uh, my results. But what is uh, sometimes uh, the main challenge is then when we sit down to discuss a digital project, the very first question I always ask is always the same: What is the customer experience you want to provide to your customers? Features comes later. No clarity on the journey. Uh, no clarity on what's going to be the way to implement successfully uh, a digital proposition. No matter how the digital proposition is good. OK. Um, Sam, let's take that from Francesco about the challenges of building this digital journey. Of course, ClassPass, you've invested a lot of money and time in building that digital journey, both with the consumer and then having to match that back into the studio partner. What are your thoughts at the moment on marketing digital, on commercializing digital, and of course, executing digital we'd love to get your thoughts on this yeah sure I mean, it kind of feels in a way like uh you know we used to always uh, hire you know digital marketers 10 years ago and now we've realized fuck it's just marketing right so there's no no such thing anymore as a an offline or above line marketer and a digital marketer this is completely holistic so it feels like uh the discussion is still almost digital and offline being mutually exclusive and I think the operators we've seen who have performed best over the last six weeks are those who've designed an inclusive strategy, who've not seen digital as just an adjunct to their offline offering, who I think on some deep level have just assumed that this will be there will be some sense of normality that resumes after this and we'll just kind of remember this as a, a fun little experiment where we got an incremental few percent of revenue and that's that. We surveyed all our students in Europe and in North America over the last week, and we found that 70% of the studios who are currently offering live stream are planning to offer live stream once offline resumes. So that, if that isn't enough to sort of raise your eyebrows, and I don't think any statistic will. So in line with that, key is to think about how can you vertically integrate your digital on your offline experience. We're talking about this before. We know the digital guys are going to come offline. If, you're, if you've got a Kayla Ritzini's or a Chris Hemsworth, I mean, I'd love for him to obviously open a studio in Byron. Who knows? It might happen. If you've got them, they're thinking the opposite, right? They're thinking, how can we leverage these millions of people on our database, this highly engaged audience that we can then funnel into an offline experience? So I think operators need to be thinking that way. It's like, ultimately, what strategic imperative does digital serve for you? Is digital about incremental revenue for you, a cherry on top? Is digital potentially a bigger slice of your revenue? Do you want to use it to open up the world? Because again, class class surveying, we're seeing that a key interesting point for people in accessing digital is getting to work out at studios across the world that they wouldn't have been able to access in person, which is really interesting. Something else is, uh, do does your digital offering give people a sense of community? So do you insist on your cameras on? Do you make sure your instructor shouts out everybody's name in person? 
Do you follow up afterwards with comms and nurture these people? Again, we're not seeing that a lot. So my, my strong sense is that people need to sit down and look at, number one, it's a holistic marketing strategy, but your marketeer who is used to marketing offline is not necessarily going to have the skill set. So it could be a nice way for us to help our agency uh, counterparts who've seen all their media spend cut, get, get a consultant in who's an expert in this and think about what purpose digital serves. Some studios we're seeing uh, throwing out all their digital classes for free and they're purely using, think about like a, a SaaS model, right? They're using, it's essentially like issuing a white paper and building a database like you might do, Ross, to ultimately offer a product for free to blow up the top of your funnel and then hope that you build some trust and love so that they'll convert into a paying customer offline. And one other thing I'd say that I think, Paul, I may be stealing your thunder. I'm sorry. Please jump in there. I thought it was fascinating what you said uh, on this call a couple of days ago. This idea of gamifying and incentivizing people who are using a digital product and carrying that over into offline and having that vertical integration. So, Paul, you get in a, in a world of capacity restrictions, Paul working out with Ross, his wonderful, very muscular instructor uh, online gets Paul to the front of the queue to access Ross's six capacity classes offline, for example. I think that's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you want to comment more on that, Paul, but I think that's a very, very interesting opportunity. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. I, I, I think we need to have, make sure that we have that content available all the time. So, you know, if that, if that stream needs to, if, if you have, you know, a, a lot of clubs already have virtual in place or the rest of it. So there's, there's an obvious thing, if you're streaming online, you need, that also needs to, that offline, online experience also needs to come offline onto platforms and, and then, and then mix those two. That's where I see the uniqueness. And, and, and it's not, it's not, uh, this is consumer they're, they're saying they just want access. You know, if I still want to be brave and go into a gym, I still might want to have that trainer session that was delivered on Thursday, but on my player when I'm training on Monday, um, because I, I still want that trainer, but maybe I'm not, I'm not actually able to deliver it. But I think the other thing I, I want to add is, and, and this has not come from me, this is a, a lot of the kind of top operators around the world that I've been speaking to is, what they're really looking at, and I, I, we've talked, but all of us have talked, um, digital journey, you know, what's the digital journey at home, what's the, what's the now the new normal physical journey, but I think a way of, because we're talking to some of the CEOs, and they were saying, look, to get my team to really think about it, and, and a, in a way that it's not just a crowbar added to, you know, digital just added to our, our membership options, is start a game. So what does a digital proposition look like that's monetized, i.e., you know, free content here, live streaming is paid, and then one-to-one -one training is is um, even higher um, yielding membership. And then and then have your norm, have your now your up, your other membership tiers. So you pay as you go, your 12 month, and and see where they interlate. You know, see if there's a world that they correlate, and that's how you build your packages moving forward. And I think we're seeing that now. Um, it's, it, but I think I'm worried about the clubs that aren't thinking like that because that's how you monetize. At the moment, I think a lot of people have gone, okay, we'll just chuck it out for free to just try, try and hold our membership base, um, which doesn't make sense long term because you, you're going to have to have that offering really, really clear so people know what they're buying. Thanks, Paul. Uh, let's change the, the, the turn of the direction, gents. Let's maybe look at the kind of future of digital in the short in the midterm, uh, I know that we can go all the way down a rabbit hole if we look long term, but we're just going to look at this for maybe the next kind of six to twelve to twenty-four months. Uh, Francesco, I'll bring you in to start on this. Um, first of all, I know that we've got a range of operators on this um, summit here today, from hospitality to health to spa to fitness, a whole range. Uh, Francesco, can you just quickly state some of the examples of the clients that you're working with, because what I want to try and make people understand is digital is available to all at every single level. So Francesco, maybe just dot around some of the ecosystem that you're working with currently and then follow up a little bit more about some of the kind of future outlooks for short and midterm digital. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, let, let's say uh, just doing some example of uh, of, uh, of uh, operators that uh, are, uh, we are currently dealing with. Uh, starting from the, the club, the club segment, uh, of course, uh, uh, Virgin Active. Uh, we're working very close uh, uh, with the Virgin Active group. Uh, they are implementing a full, uh, a full journey using uh, using digital uh, that reached a very high level of engagement uh, even uh, uh, even uh, even before uh, before the crisis, and now, of, co of course, during the crisis, using the platform to keep. Uh, 
to keep uh, a rapport with customers. And also we have examples of, uh, for example, in, in, uh, in Italy, Virgin, Virgin Active is also selling uh, uh, Technogen bikes at home to provide uh, streaming content. So that gives just an idea, uh, just, uh, just an example of, uh, again, reaching uh, people where people are. Uh, uh, we have ex great examples even uh, even uh, even in Asia. Uh, Fitness First Icon CM in Bangkok is a great example of a great center that is uh, featuring uh, uh, connected uh, experiences. Uh, we have uh, uh, independent operators like, for example, Babel in uh, in Kuala Lumpur is a, is a very iconic uh, 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 center. Uh, two centers actually that is uh, very successfully using uh, our solution with essentially all the members or example in boutique like uh, uh, zadi training is a good example uh, because adela Boto will also uh, uh, join as a speaker at this event but then uh, hospitality rosewood hong kong is a great example for uh, they are using uh, our technology to connect with uh, with their guests in terms of group classes connected equipment uh, but also they have suites with connected equipment so that people can also work out in the room. Uh, corporate, Volkswagen Group in Spain has implemented the Train at Home uh, program for all employees in order to provide every day a different program to perform at home. Uh, universities, Lagborough Uni University is uh, the, the hub for Team GB in UK and actually they are using My Wellness and now they are also implementing the program for for uh, students uh, uh, at home. So I just uh, wanted to let you have, a, a, you know, very different examples from very different segments uh, and industry, because to me, there is one point here. Uh, digital is not for very few people. Digital is for, ev is, uh, for, every, for every single, uh, single business. And probably right now, we have to take advantage of this situation to say, do this exercise. Let's imagine that for a moment I don't have uh, the four walls and I will not have the four walls. Okay, how do we redesign the customer experience? And this is going to be great in order to drive those insights that we will allow each business uh, to combine the benefit of the reopening, but without neglecting the new need uh, of the consumers. Okay. Um, Sam, let me bring you on here as well. Um, a little bit more about the kind of outlook for digital as you see it, please. Um, quickly, I know we're conscious of time, so if you can wrap things up in two minutes, that would be great. Joining me, Ross, thinly veiled, swipe at my tangential nature. Uh, digital, to my point before, yes, it, it's certainly here. It's not going away. COVID we've seen across the industry has been an accelerant of trends that were already sort of bubbling away. The joke is people are either getting, you know, married or divorced at the moment. I think that extends to business where we've seen bricks and mortar retail floundering uh, and digital. We, we sort of always knew it was there bubbling away, but now it's, it's here and it's front and centre and it's here to stay. My, my biggest kind of uh, one little uh, snippet that's interesting is around, and I think to Francesco's point before with the Rosewood, is that there are some ancillary activities outside of fitness that are seeing really good success on digital. So if you're a, a wellness brand, I wouldn't necessarily rule it out because on ClassPass, we've seen appetite for things like uh, digital Reiki healing or you know digital digital psychic readings, uh, dance classes. We, we saw a class with Face Gym have more than a thousand class classes tune in, which is like you sort of give yourself massages and plant your collagen in your face. I don't think anyone on this call needs that, but for people who do, uh, that's something that's out there. So that's something that, that we've been a bit surprised by is, is the demand for the ancillary activities outside of fitness. And yes, it's certainly here to stay. Uh, Paul, uh, some closing thoughts on digital and uh, short term outlooks. I think I think short term is we, we have to get that proposition right. You know, we really have to think about, you know, and, and I think to the, we have to get the proposition right. We have to understand what we're offering and where we're offering it in that in that package. Um, I think, you know, we have to be we have to be really agile to customer feedback. We can't just think the doors are open and everything will change, everything will go back again. I think we have to really test small with our with our clients, but also prospects also, because I think this is a great opportunity and I think people are forgetting about this is the great opportunity of everyone that's gone through the doors you know these legacy businesses that have had so many people everyone's whole business whole mindset is shift you know consumer patterns have changed we're not traveling as much anymore 
um, you know, localized communities. Is, so where they might have canceled the membership because they're traveling so much, now that they can actually go back to the gym, if there's a, if there's a clear offering, i.e. I can engage digitally, I can still have the expertise of the club and then come in physically when I want. You know, I think there's even operators that are thinking that they will do a, a digital membership with, you know, two times a, two times a month um, that they can actually actually access the physical club. Like if we get that right, short term, and we're agile to the changes in consumer demand, we're in a really good spot. Like, you know, I don't want to kill my closing message, but, you know, I, I really think that this this actually means that we can grow the whole pie. You know, why I got into the whole digital side, coming from an operator to digital, is that I believe that we weren't going to move the needle in terms of how many people were engaging with gym memberships based off the current model that we are. This is forcing us to change the current model, which in my eyes actually means that our, our expertise and service, which we've been delivering for years, in a way has always been kept in the four walls. Now we can get it out. We can truly actually show people that this is how good our bloody industry is and grow it. And I think that goes for hotels and wellness as well. You know, we're, we're look at working for likes of Malia and Marriott and Barcelo, and they're all looking at where it was very, let's just execute virtual in our gym offering. Now it's actually, well, the consumers are kind of saying they want it in their rooms. So I really think there's going to be an actually bit of an uptick in regards to having fitness offering in people's rooms because, you know, right now, do I want, do I know and can I trust the members that go down into a gym, a hotel gym space? Question mark. Can I trust my own environment? Totally. So therefore, that's where I'll work out. So it's not just home fitness as we're seeing it because we're in lockdown. It's also as we move forward, we need to make sure that we're delivering value there. And I think some of these hotel brands are getting it right. Thanks. Uh, Francesco, I want to leave you with a positive message to the industry, if you can, please, for a minute. Sure. Um, yeah, I would like to to take uh, to take uh, you know uh, a, a, some some sentences from my favorite film, uh, one of my favorite actually, which is uh, uh, Any Given Sunday with uh, with Al Pacino. And uh, in this film, there is a moment before a match where actually uh, uh, he is the coach of the team and is inspiring the, the the entire the entire team with one of the most beautiful uh, speeches that uh, uh, we have seen. Uh, because we see the market as American football uh, today. Why? First, a lot of effort to gain inches. One inches, two inches. Second, you can fail as an individual or you can win as a team. And this is the same, the same for us. We can fail as individual businesses or we can win as an industry. And finally, the beauty is that those inches we need to win the game are everywhere. Uh, and this crisis has created an incredible amount of problems, but will create the same amount of incredible opportunities. So it's really up to us to those to, to go out and uh, find those inches that we need uh, to, to win, find those inches that we need to increase the market size because if there is one big learning uh, from COVID is that health is the most important thing for people. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, Sam, 30 seconds. Uh, so I do quote now. I don't have Al Pacino. Uh, maybe Little Prince. Uh, this, uh, I'm probably mangling it, but uh, what is essential is unseen. And I think to Francesco's point, this whole experience has came at home, how absolutely integral health and wellness is to our immunity, our mental health, our physical health. And we've all got this chance to press pause and evaluate our mindless consumerism. And I think we'll be reticent to get back on the treadmill of expensive holidays and purchasing. And we'll realize that things like relationships and family and friends and certainly health and physical exercise are absolutely the, the, the top of the tree in terms of our priorities. So I'm very bullish on consumer sentiment towards health and wellness post-COVID. Thank you, gents. I know there's been a couple of questions and apologies, we haven't got time for those. One of them was, can digital help to show how busy the gym is? Uh, if you go to the car park, can you see how many spaces are left in? I believe that technology has already been launched in China 
and also now a little bit in Hong Kong as well. So yes, it can is the answer to that and there's applications to do that. Um, Paul, Francesco, Sam, thank you very much, gents, for your time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached uh, the deadline for this one particular uh, session. And uh, Next up, you've got a 30-minute break to go and visit the exhibition and the networking. And then following on from that at 3.30, you'll see the little icon from sessions light up on the left-hand side, and you can jump into a session in 30 minutes' time. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, thank you for your time, and I wish you a great rest of the event. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye for now. Stay safe.